So we'll continue a little bit talking about motors and we'll watch some, um, some how it works and how it's made videos. Shut off the camera for that part. But remember last time what we talked about was the different types of electricity that are available. And typically we, offer, we run most motors commonly off of AC because that's what's available. But there are of course DC motors. Uh, in power tools, it used to be more common to use universal motors, which run off of AC or DC. Nowadays, most power tool motors are DC because they're going to use battery banks. Um, but in industry, in real size motors for real things, and what I mean is larger scale things, uh, we typically use AC motors. And so most of these motors are, are so-called induction motors, and they use what's called a squirrel cage. Basically, the way this works is you've got a rotor it's connected to the shaft, and you've got a coil on what's called the stator. The stator is the part that's stationary. It doesn't rotate. The rotor is what rotates. Typically got bearings, seals, all kinds of interesting things on, on either end of the rotor. It's pretty common to also have a fan to blow air over the motor and keep it cool. You can see this is more of an industrial motor. It's got an eye hook at the top because it would be very heavy, so you probably have to use a crane to move it around. Uh, but the interesting thing about these types of motors is that the rotor, which includes the squirrel cage, okay, and a bunch of rotor laminations, has no electrical connection to it. There is current that flows through this rotor. However, that current is induced into it. It's inducted. It's kind of like a transformer. You've got to study transformers, I guess, in your electronics course, so maybe a little bit. Okay. Well, that's what's going on here. This is kind of like a transformer. Current is being induced from this coil into the, the rotor and basically it sets up opposing magnetic fields that causes the thing to turn. Now beyond that, I can't really help you very much. I'm not all that intuitively aware of exactly how, what direction the current's flowing. I do know that the current is flowing in the squirrel cage itself. It's not in the laminations, or maybe some in the laminations, but one of the points of the laminations is to transmit the magnetic field, not the electric field. At least that's my understanding. You could prove me wrong on that, but my understanding of this is that the current flows along the length of these and ends up generating a magnetic field where basically the magnetism is perpendicular so that you can apply a moment. So a way to think about this is all motors, whether AC or DC, are basically generating magnets that oppose each other. So just like when you take two permanent magnets on the table and you put the the north end against the north end, you can push one with the other. That's all that's going on here. It's just a whole lot of big magnets, and so you end up with a significant amount of torque and power output from this thing. So, um, what we care more about is the performance of motors. And so, here's a, a typical uh, torque speed cur curve for an AC motor. And there's some interesting points here. We'll start off with the locked rotor torque. So this is the minimum amount of torque that's developed at rest for all positions of a rotor at the rated voltage and frequency. What does it mean by all positions? Is that along this entire curve? No. This curve is talking about torque on the x-axis and rotational speed on the y-axis. So we're talking about when it's at rest, then we're all on this line. But it turns out that because of the way that the motor is made with current flowing only through discrete legs of the squirrel cage, Depending on exactly what the angle of the rotor is, you'll develop a different locked rotor torque. It's not a lot of difference, but there is a little bit of difference. Okay. And so that's why they're saying locked rotor torque is the minimum torque. So whatever the worst position is, however much torque you, you generate there, that's the so-called locked rotor torque. Does that make sense? So that's this point down. It's also called the starting torque. Is that point down on the, the x-axis. The breakdown torque is the maximum to torque that the motor will develop. Now this is a really important point because think about it, if you have a motor that's not under load and you start it up so you get up to uh, full speed and then you apply a load to it, you're supposed to reach what's the, called the full load speed at the full load torque. This is actually a rating point for the motor. This is where the torque being developed is 100% of how much it's supposed to develop. And, of course, the speed is not actually the maximum, it's a little bit below maximum because most AC motors slip a little bit. Don't worry about what that means right now. What it means for our purposes is that it doesn't turn quite as fast as you would expect it to theoretically. But that doesn't matter because it's developing torque and the whole reason 
combine the motor in the first place is to build torque at speed, or at least close to speed. What's interesting, though, is that if you start adding more and more load, the motor will have to develop more and more torque, and it will slow down in order to do that. If you add so much torque that you reach the breakdown torque, the motor will slow down and it will coast to a stop. Not coast to a stop, it will actually come to a stop. The reason for that is because once you reach the breakdown torque, the motor can't develop enough torque to keep turning, right? And so instead of moving back along the curve this way, which would require a reduction in load, the motor simply generates less and less torque. And since the torque requirement from whatever machine it's driving is still the same, well, then it eventually comes to a stop. So the breakdown torque is a torque you never really want to reach when you're operating a motor. You might go near it, but you certainly wouldn't want to get to the breakdown torque because you could basically lock up the rotor. Okay? The full load torque, I've already mentioned that, but that's the torque that the motor is rated for at the full load rated speed. Now there are many different types of motors. That's a generic curve for most motors. We'll start off talking about single phase motors because you're most likely to be, or more likely to be familiar with those. So we've actually got four different types here. We've got a shaded pole motor. And in fact, I thought I saw one around here. Where did I have that? I should have grabbed it. I've got one next door. Uh, while I'm playing a video, I'll see if I can find it, and, and I'll bring it in here and you can pass it around. But how many of you have an exhaust fan in your bathroom at home? Anybody? Okay. Well, if you have an exhaust fan in your bathroom, it probably uses a shaded pulled motor. See, here's the thing. When you have single phase current, I don't remember how to explain why, but basically you can't get the motor to start on its own. It needs some help. And so by including these shaded poles, it changes the magnetic field so that you can actually get the rotor to start. Now, what that means is that these poles, or shading coils, th these coils end up sort of dragging the rotor once it's going. And so this type of motor is not very efficient. But it's cheap, it's easy to produce, it's rugged and reliable. So for a bathroom fan, who really cares? It's not much drawing much power anyway. So, and you don't use it for very long, and so a shaded pole motor is an economical solution for that application. However, if you have an air conditioner unit outside your home, say you have central air, well then you probably use a capacitor start motor. Now the way this works is that there's a capacitor that is in series, this is the starting capacitor, it's in series with a starting winder, winding, but there's also a run winding. So in other words, these two windings are coils that are literally in the stator. Let me go back. These are two coils that would be mounted in here. Now your motor, for your, for your AC unit, it's not going to look like this, right? This is a big industrial motor. It's smaller, but same principle. Now this is an industrial motor. It would actually have three coils in it for three phase, but we're not talking about that type. You would have two windings and probably in a hermetically sealed compressor for your AC compressor, but they would still be two stator windings. One is used for starting, the other is not. What happens is by using these two windings, you can actually generate uh, torque in one direction so that the rotor will start rotating in the desired direction. And the starting capacitor is kind of like something that helps kick it and get it started. But what happens is once the rotor starts turning, it includes an electrical connection on the rotor. Now this electrical connection is not really an electrical connection, it's more of a mechanical connection. It's just a fly, not a flywheel, but a centrifugal wheel. And what happens as the rotor starts to rotate, it throws out this, this, this uh, a centrifugal, the centrifugal arms, I'll show you some here in a minute, and pushes against a switch to shut off the start winding and the start capacitor, and that allows the motor to run at higher efficiency. But this is just a mechanism, it's a mechanical and electrical mechanism, to get the motor to start turning and let it continue turning with more efficiency after it started. And so you'll notice that the shaded pole motor curve is pretty crappy, right? We generate a relatively low amount of torque versus speed, whereas the capacitor start would be ideal for your compressor. Did you know that compressors require a significant amount of power and torque to drive? Matter of fact, in the summertime, most of your electric bill is probably from your running your air conditioning unit. Okay. HVAC just takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of power, and so that's why this type of motor is typically specified for the hermetically sealed compressor component in your air conditioning system because it generates a lot of torque for its size. It generates a lot of power for its size. Now you'll notice that initially there's more power, but there's, there's less efficiency in this section. So what happens right here, that's where the 
the centrifugal switch is uh, clicked and the starting wind is taken out so you generate a little bit less uh, torque but at higher efficiency. And so in this region, you're using the running winding, whereas in this region, both windings are active and the rotor is just starting up. Let me show you what a uh, centrifugal switch looks like on a motor. Eh, yeah, that's about what it looks like. So what this is, this would be mounted on the rotor. You've got some springs here that are trying to keep these weights in. But as they rotate, these weights tend to come out. And then they're able to, there's another piece. I don't know where it's at. Uh, I don't remember. But basically, it pushes on a switch that turns off the start capacitor. Okay. And usually it's mounted in the back end of it. You can see it here. Uh, let's see. There's the switch. There's the flywheel. A centrifugal uh, a mechanism mounted on the rotor. Uh, they would just throw this. Oh, I remember how it works. Um, when the uh, when the weights move, what happens is it pushes something axially on the shaft, and that's what pushes against the switch, so that it can basically. I, I think it's it's either going to be this end. No, this would be attached to the shaft. It must be this end that gets pushed out and rides against the switch and keeps the switch deactivated. Um, another picture of the same thing. So this part's mounted rigidly to the rotor, and the rotor shaft, and then this part, as the these weights fly out, they push this farther and disengage the switch. So you can disengage the capacitor. So it's kind of like two ends of the spectrum, right? Weakest, least efficient motor, strongest, most efficient motor. And these are in between. There's two other ways to get motors to start. Uh, that are single phase motors. One is to not have a centrifugal switch, just have a permanent split capacitor. So your starting winding and your capacitor always end up uh, sucking up power essentially. They don't really do a whole lot to get the rotor to. They help it start, but they don't really help it continue. So that's this curve here, the permanent split capacitor. And you would use that for smaller motors where the inefficiency of this is not uh, a problem, but the inefficiency of a shaded pole would be a problem because you can't generate enough torque and it sucks up too much energy. There's also a split phase that includes a centrifugal starting switch. Now this type does not have a capacitor start and you'll see the split phase here. This is where the extra phase is cut out and the main phase is in operation or the main winding I should say is in operation. What this really does is it makes all of these things whether it's the capacitor start or just the split phase or even the, the permanent split capacitor, what it does is it makes the two coils have an offset phase between them. And when you have an offset phase, you can generate torque in the motor and actually get it to turn. Motor housings. Now these motor housings really, in all fairness, are uh, more likely to be three-phase than single-phase. But some of these housings cross over to single-phase, especially like a C-phase motor, for example. The faces of these motors are typically standardized, and then the, the size, things like distance between the shaft and foot of the motor are also standard, standardized so that you can go out and buy a motor from Valdor and replace it with a motor from XYZ Chinese company if you want to, right? Because it's all standardized, and so they're interchangeable motors. Now, the details of the motor and how good it is, how efficient it is, how reliable it is, all that will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Of course, each manufacturer will tell you that their motor is the best, right? What else are they going to say? They'll try to get you to buy their motor. But the nice thing is that you can pull out motors, electric motors like this, and replace them. I really wish that in the mechanical world we were better at engines and making engines standardized. Because I think it would be neat to be able to swap out engines very easily. In fact, I wish that we had modular engines. Now, notice I, I've distinguished engine from motor. I do not call the thing under the hood of your car a motor unless I'm talking about the starter. Okay. If it uses electricity to produce shaft power, I call it a motor. If it uses pistons or uh, uh, you know, gasoline to produce shaft power, I call it an engine because it's a heat engine. So I'm going to try and enforce that with your vocabulary, so don't be upset at me. I'm just trying to train you. So these are all motors. And with, with engines, I wish that engines were more modular where you could put on this bank of, of valves and this bank of, of cylinders 
and you know just change it out at will, or when you need an oil change, just drop the whole thing out and put another one in. Let's keep going. You know, but uh, we're not to that point yet. Kind of sounds like a rotary. <laughs> well, I think that the pistons would have to be set up. We're going to do a rotary, but not actually use a rotary type engine. We'd have to set up the pistons on a, a, a rotary axis of some kind. Anyway. So there's many different options. You'll notice that we've got some that are open, protected, drift proof. What is this? Well, notice there are no holes in the top. If something, oil, water, whatever, drips on the top of this, it won't be sucked into the motor. It won't just fall into the motor very easily. Now, you can't completely keep liquid out of this motor. There's still holes in it. But these holes are for ventilation because no motor is 100% efficient. Some motor, notice I said motor. You take in electricity. And the electrical power you take in will not come out completely as shaft power. Some of it's going to convert to heat in the motor, and you've got to keep the motor cool. The number one thing that burns up motors is excessive heat. Right? That's what makes the windings fail, because the windings get too hot, then the, the, the gunk that covers the windings and insulates it will fail, and you'll have coils arcing out. Anyway, now there's also TENV. What is this? This is totally enclosed, non-ventilated. That's what this stands for. You notice there's no holes in this. It's not ventilated at all. So how do you get the heat out? Well, notice they've included fins here so that hopefully you can uh, transfer heat by conductivity and then convect it away, preferably by fan mounted on the motor. That's what this is. It's a totally enclosed, it's like this, fan-cooled motor. You see this shroud on the back? That's a sheet metal shroud. And what it does is it covers up the fan what the fan does, it's mounted to the rotor, and as the rotor turns, it pulls air across these heat exchanger fins. Okay, so that's a good, good motor. Here's a totally enclosed fan-cooled fan explosion proof. If you have a motor in a sugar factory, you do not want it generating sparks. Because there's going to be sugar dust everywhere, right? Sugar dust can explode. Sugar dust has exploded in the past. Go ahead. Uh, so what about, is there oil in these things? The oil that you need is at the bearings. Okay, and so does that oil degrade with the heat? Well, sure, it can degrade with the heat, but you've got to spec an oil, and the manufacturer would do this, uh, that would be resistant to the heat. There are, there are greases and things that you use on your brakes of your car, which get really hot, that can withstand the heat. So it's just a more special oil. That answer your question? Well, yeah, but like if it's totally enclosed, like how do you do maintenance on it? Well, you typically don't. If you need to, if your motor stops working, you take it out and you put another one in and you send it to a motor repair shop. Okay. okay typically, uh, an industrial organization, some manufacturers, not going to, unless they're huge and they have a lot of motors in a motor shop, they're not going to take their motors and maintenance them. I mean, yeah, you might include, uh, you might try to lubricate them, but in that case, the manufacturer's motor would include a way to lubricate. The uh, TENV. Yeah. Um, so since that is really relying on fins to mm -hmm. draw the heat, that would be probably a lower power motor. Right. Would. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You wouldn't push this one as hard as you could push this one, for example. Now the big difference between these two, they look like basically the same thing. The big difference is that basically, you notice these boxes off to the side. Anybody know what that's for? That's where you connect it. That's where you hook up the wires. This type of motor has really good sealing around the housing so that once you put it all together, gases can't pass through here or it's highly restricted. So that hopefully any sparks in here cannot contact an explosive atmosphere. That's why it's called an explosive proof motor. This one already won't explode at least from the motor windings and everything but because it's completely enclosed. But it can because of the, the connections in here. Right? So if there's a spark inside of the connection, this can cause an explosion. This one won't. Okay. Questions so far on that? Anything else? Probably have to have special uh, fan material and stuff too, so that that's not sparking if the shroud oh, yeah. is it or yeah. doesn't build up static electricity. Right. That's a very good point because fans, since they're moving through air, can easily build up static charge, but can also discharge to ground. You're right. That's a good point. So it's probably a different kind of shroud on the back there too. In fact, uh, I'm not sure if you'd make that out of plastic or what, or if you'd have to ground the fan somehow or make the fan do. If the fan is made of steel, then it's not really a problem because then it's connected to ground directly. Uh, okay, here's a wash down duty. If you have a process where you say you're 
I don't know, dealing with food products. Uh, one of the specifications of food, a lot of food production lines is it has to be able to be washed down. You've got to be able to spray it with soap and water and it not destroy it or cause any uh, degradation of the components of the process. And so this is a washed down rated motor where you could literally spray it with soap and water and it would be just fine. Here's a severe duty motor. You notice that it has fins even on the face to try and get as much heat out as possible. Here's a brake motor. What do we mean when we say brake motor? All it really means is, notice that this is extended on the back. All it really means is that there's a brake on the back of it. Most of these motors, if you shut off power to them, they'll keep turning for a little while. They'll coast down. A brake motor, there's a couple of different options on the brakes. Some brakes you have to activate, so you have extra wiring, where once you shut off the power to the motor, you can either let it coast down or you can apply brakes. Some of these are mechanically driven, so that as you, uh, as it slows down, a centrifugal switch basically activates the brake because it's no longer pushing against the brake spring. Uh, there's, there's many different options here. Uh, some of these, most of them, the way they're set up is the brake is electrically activated. So basically, once you disconnect power to the motor, you disconnect power to the solenoid that's pushing the brake and keeping the brake from activating, it's basically pushing against the spring, and so the brake just automatically activates. The problem with this type is if that solenoid fails, you'll try to turn the motor on and the brake's active because the solenoid is failed. Yeah? Um, would it be a safe assumption if I was trying to visually compare motors that the one I thought looked like it dealt with the most heat, that it expelled the most heat from the motor would be the most powerful one or have the most power capabilities? Yeah, that's not a bad beginning approximation, but really what you want to do is look at the cut sheet on the motor. What I mean by the cut sheet is just the specifications on from the manufacturer. Because really, most of the time when you're trying to select a motor, the motor has to fit in a certain area. And so that constrains the, the geometry of the face and the feet and how big they can be. And then you're just looking for a motor that will fit in the geometry you need and will not cause a problem in its environment, but also generate the power and the torque that you need. Beyond that, you don't, really don't care about anything. I guess, I don't know why, I was saying like if you are going through a scrapyard and you had a bunch of motors laying around. Oh yeah, yeah, well even then I'd want to look up, I'd want to see if I could find uh, data on the motor to, to use. Yeah? A lot, of the, a lot of the brake motors that I've seen in the EU right now, mm -hmm. uh, the brake is actually electromagnetic. Yeah, sure. And, yeah. and we have both scenarios where some of them you apply a current, it engages the brake. Right. Others, you disconnect current and it engages the brake. And this Both gets spring. right. And this gets into the question of: Do you want it to fail? If things fail, if power fails, do you want the motor to coast down, or do you want it to stop immediately? Which one is safer? Yeah. A lot of times, it's a safety question. Now, you're talking about brakes. Uh, when you say electromagnetics, I assume you're talking about an eddy current type brake. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's there's many different ways of braking. The motor, but you're right, the type that I described with just friction material is available, but there are other options. I was going to kind of save that discussion for brakes and clutches, which is another topic we talked about. But yeah, you're right, there's actually many different types of brakes available. And friction brakes and eddy current brakes are just two of the options. It's a good discussion. Anything else? You'll notice that some of these, the way you mount them is by their feet, right? There's bolt holes in the feet. Others, you notice that the face is machined and there are bolt holes in it. The difference between, this is another big difference in selection. For this type of motor, you'll mount it to the frame by the feet. For this type of motor, most of the time, what you're doing is your, your what's it called? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Close mounting, is that the right terminology? I can't remember now. Is it's it a face mounting? Yes, it's a face mounting, but it's... Uh, or it's like connected through a bell housing like a transmission to the back of the Yeah, it's more like that. Yeah, where, where basically the way the motor is mounted to the device, is, or to the machine, is it's mounted to the device it's going to drive. And so it, it's uh, close coupled. That's what I'm looking for. Close coupled is the word. Because with a, a type like this, most of the time you have a coupling that sits on the shaft and then couples it to something else. This type you literally bolt it up to, and yeah, you're right, if you've ever worked on a transmission, and, a, and an engine, typically the, the engine crankshaft goes right into the, the input of the transmission. So that's a close coupling type of scenario. You don't have an actual flexible coupling or rigid coupling between the two. But of course on a transmission, most of the time the, you've got splines going in. The splines usually come from the uh, uh, 
uh, or is it the other way? No, you usually have splines coming out of the transmission going into the pressure plate, the way that usually works. But it is a close coupling type of scenario. It's just in that case, in the case of the engine and the transmission, you're putting the, the clutch between the two. Uh, and of course, you can do something similar here with these. So there's a fundamental difference. Now, you'll notice that this one has an option of either close coupling or connecting to the face or connecting feet to the frame. So some motors have both options. All right, a little bit more and then we'll watch a video, okay? So total enclosed, non-ventilated, totally enclosed fan cooled, totally enclosed expro explosion proof or totally enclosed fan cooled explosion proof motors, right? Open, uh, have no drip protection, protected or use a drip proof and only have openings in the lower. So let's see um, more examples of the same. Uh, open, protected, drip proof, you notice that the holes are all near the bottom. Totally enclosed, non-ventilated, lint can't get into this. Totally enclosed, fan cooled, so this is totally enclosed but it's got a fan cooling, so yeah, you could drive this one harder than this one. And here's an explosion proof where the, the connection for the wires are also, and like you were saying, probably the fan may to not generate uh, sparks. Here are some standard motor frame sizes. And so you'll notice you've got frame size designations here and the standard horsepower of those sizes. You've got some standard dimensions <coughs> here for what size the keyway is, how long the shaft is, overall motor length, the distance between the center line of the shaft and the feet of the motor. So you see that all these things are, are standardized, which is very convenient when you're trying to switch manufacturers if it's necessary. All right, before we talk about motor control, this is a good place to pause. As a matter of fact, yeah, this is a good place to pause. We'll, we'll pause the camera. We'll watch a How It's Made video, then we'll go off and go back and complete some more slides.